So this is going to be a bit of a different video. Today I hit 500 subscribers. Thank you for everybody who subscribed. Thank you for everybody who's watched so far. And because I think it might be interesting and because it's always useful to understand as a baseline where I'm coming from, I thought I would give a review of my actual collection. So I've got a lot of knives that I've already reviewed and I've got a lot more that I'm going to review. And as with a lot of people in the knife community, those knives come and go. There's a lot that I buy and I think I'm going to like and I don't like, or a lot that I just like initially and then like less. But what I'm going to look at here are the knives that have been in my collection for a while by this point that are the ones that I know are my keepers and sort of everything else builds around them. At the end, I'm going to have a couple sort of honorary mentions of more recent pickups that might stay in the collection. But my general rule of thumb is I've got a single Pelican case with 21 knives in it and or 21 spaces in it. And so I try to keep my collection to 21 knives. And generally, I've been able to do that. You're going to see we're a little bit over that 21 right now, but let's get into it. First one here is my Spider Codelica. This one here is in Super Blue and Sus 410. <clears throat> the Delica is just an awesome light knife. It's a phenomenal EDC choice. It is light. It is easy to carry. The ergonomics of this old school handle are fantastic. And even though the blade stock is thin, even though the steel rusts quite easily, and even though it is not a knife that you can really use even a little hard without getting worried about that tip, getting worried about bending or breaking this blade, it's really, really good at what it is. And still, there are not a lot of better lightweight EDC knives on the market today than the Spyderco Delica, especially for the price. This one, if it's still available on Spyderco's site, went for about 125 bucks when I bought it, and I think you can get it a little bit cheaper. To keep going with the Spyderco's, I am going to bring out two, oops, sorry about that, two other made in Japan Spyderco's here, two variants of the Spyderco Endura. So I'm skipping the Indela here. Um, basically, when I have the Delica and the Endura, the Endela sitting right in the middle just doesn't end up getting carried a lot once I really got used to using the Endura blade. This Endura blade, I mentioned it in my full review, is, I believe, the most useful long knife blade shape, the most useful full-size knife blade shape for most people in most cases. This drop sheep's foot, the tip is so easy to access. The jimping and the handle ergonomics work insanely well. The blade stock gets very thin. The knife gets very slicey. And this ends up being a much easier knife to use than so many long blades can be. A lot of long knives can get very ungainly, especially long and skinny ones like this. This one feels very natural to use for all sorts of cutting tasks. From your EDC stuff, this is a great box breaker downer to gardening tasks and things like that. I love this knife in the garden because this long reach and the very secure handle ergonomics I mean I can very easily get this knife behind plant stems or around things or even dig in dirt with it. And it's just very easy to maintain control of that tip. Handle ergonomics are great and it helps that like most Seki cities, it is relatively light. I mean, it could be lighter if they got rid of these uh, the steel liners, um, but it's still pretty light as far as knives go. It is quite, thin and unobtrusive in the pocket for how much knife you get. And I do really like the action of Spyderco Backlocks. And in fact, I like the Endura so much that it's one of the few worn cliffs that I have in my collection. This thing honestly is just kind of hilarious. The Endura worn cliff, it basically feels like having a giant claw when you hold it in your hand. It is so easy to get this tip down onto stuff and just scrape through everything and it is just a cutting monster for opening boxes for cutting twine for basically stuff where you're really just using that edge and scoring or cutting through thin materials this warm cliff blade just can't be beat it is so easy to pierce this tip into stuff to drag cut and use this edge and honestly it's just ridiculous in a way that's very, very fun. And it helps that 
These two are in K390, which is a fantastic steal. And especially this one, because it's in the process of being discontinued, you can get this one for like 120 bucks. And I think you can get this one for about 120 to 150 bucks as well. So as far as knives at this level of quality go, because Spyderco Seki City does do very nice knives, they're a very good choice. Next, I got two more, I got three more Spydercos. The next two are my two PM2s. So knives that I really like, I like to have pairs of, you're gonna see more pairs in the collection where I like to have pairs by the manufacturer. And these are in Maximate and 15V. So I've owned probably a dozen PM2s and these are the ones that I have kept. Um, I really like PM2s in very high hardness, high edge retention steels. My experience with the PM2 is this blade shape is robust enough that I don't really need a tough blade steel. And frankly, as far as high edge retention steels go, especially the way that Spyderco heat treats them, these are pretty tough steels. I've been able to hammer on these pretty hard. The only time I've ever chipped Maximate or 15V in my use is when I accidentally dropped a 15V shaman tip down on brick, which is going to chip basically any steel, high hardness or not. I love the way that Maximate patinas. I also really like the way that 15V patinas. I'm getting a tiny bit of rust there, but not too much. And I have done very little to treat these blades. As I mentioned in some of my other, other videos, I live literally at the beach. I am a couple hundred yards from the water. Um, I put a little bit of EDC oil on these blades every once in a while, um, usually only when I use them and they've gotten either dirty or wet, and that is it. And this is the level of patina that I'm experiencing, which is very, very minimal. These steels have been fantastic to use. I've basically only had to sharpen them once ever for however much I use them. And that once was literally a day where I spent the entire day cutting up reams of carpet, which again, would dull just about any blade. Um, I've also found these steels quite easy to sharpen. I've got a, um, what's it called? A, I can't remember the name of the system right now, but it's got Venev diamond stones on it. Um, it's one of the Russian systems. I just can't remember the name for the life of me. But with diamond stones, neither 15V nor Maximate is all that difficult to sharpen. It takes a little bit more time, but it is absolutely sharpenable. The ergonomics of the PM2 are the absolute best in the business. Part of the reason I love the PM2 so much is it is, and it is my favorite spider comb. I like it even more than the native. If you told me I could only have one, it would be the PM2, not the native. The PM2, even though it's a big knife, 3.9 ounces, relatively big in the pocket, it is not huge. And especially with the ergonomics and how good this choke up position is, you don't hate carrying this as an EDC. It's solid as an EDC. It will do all your EDC tasks. You've heard me mention some of my earlier reviews. This blade edge is sort of magical in its ability to always be exactly where you need it to be. Whatever you're cutting, if you're cutting down on something, cutting through something, dragging, pulling, anything like that, the edge of the PM2 is always exactly where you want it to be. And so you just can think about cutting. You don't have to think about watching your edge, making sure it's in the right place. The tip is small enough for piercing, and yet this blade is still tough enough that it can do anything you would need in the hard use domain. But the real master stroke of the PM2 is this handle, which has this extraordinary ability with the all the humps they put in here and all that, and this jimping here and this jimping down here, that the harder you grip it, the better it feels. I think ergonomically, there's probably not a better hard use knife on the market than the PM2. The harder you grab this thing, the better it feels. And so if I have a day that I know I'm going to be doing lots of more aggressive knife stuff, the PM2 is my choice virtually every single time. The only one knife that comes close to it is one that's going to be coming up when I get to Chris Reeve. So those are my PM2s. Oh, and by the way, scales here, aftermarket scales, obviously these are from Cerberus Knives. This is um, black linda micarta with a, I think that's G10 inlay. And then these are from RC Blade Works, natural linda micarta, both highly recommendable scale makers. I got one more 
Spiderco on the list. Move that out of the way. Sorry for that. Which is the Native Five. <clears throat> I've mentioned in multiple videos that the Native 5, I think, is one of the best 3-inch knives on the market. It's probably the second best 3-inch knife on the market, and it really does come down. This one here is a Maximet. Maximet really is one of my favorite steels for all the reasons I mentioned in the previous PM2 blurb. Um, and it works really well on the Native here. The Native just has extraordinarily good ergonomics for a small knife. This pinch grip here, front finger in the choil, back finger on the jimping, gives you so much control over the blade. It fills your hand despite being a relatively small knife. You can do just about anything. You have to go into real hard use tasks before it feels like this knife isn't enough. The blade stock is perfectly designed, just thick enough to be pushed hard, while still being thin enough that you get a very slicey edge. The tip pierces well. The ergonomics of the whole handle, even when you grip back, work magnificently. It's just a wonderful little life. And then on top of that, a well broken in Golden City backlock. Sorry about that. It is smooth. It is consistent. It is easy to operate with one hand as long as you're not under a camera. It's got nice audible, audible feedback. You get a nice clack on the open, a nice snap on the close, tactile. It's just fantastic. This is certainly one of my most carried knives. It might even be the most carried knife over the last couple of years. Because most days, this is all the knife I need. And again, if, if the PM2 wasn't so great, this would be my favorite Spyderco. So it sits clearly at number two. And every single time I've sold off all my natives, I have ended up buying one again, not that long after. That does it for Spyderco. Again, I've reviewed tons and tons of other Spydercos. And there are some others that might be keepers, but there are none other that are as solidly keepers as those. Now we're going to go to the two axis locks that I've got, or axis lock bar lock variants, which are my two Hogue Decas. Actually, no, I've got more bar locks, but these are my two Hogues. Hogue Deca Mini and Hogue Deca Big Boy, or Hogue RSK. Sorry, I keep calling them the Deca. The Hogue RSK Mini and the Hogue RSK Full Size. This is a better knife than the Deca, both of these. Um, this is a better small knife than the Deca. This is a better large knife than it's not even comparable to the Deca because it's so much bigger. This little guy, this sub three inch knife, is one of the best three inch knives on the market. It is thin, it is light, it has extremely good action, snappy on the open, drop shotty on the close, and this blade is as sharp as anything ever needs to be. Super neutral blade shape, a very traditional drop, drop point with some great jimping up here and fantastic fully contoured G10 handle ergonomics. Just melts in the hand, feels super secure. Great grip pattern here. This is one that pinches up really nicely. This is one of those blades that every time I am carrying this, again, unless you're going up to really heavy duty tasks, this just does everything and does it well. And on top of that, relatively affordable. I mean, you're talking well under 200 bucks for this knife, and they're starting to make a few more of them. And this one is one of the older versions in 20 CV, but these days they're in Magna Cut to boot. Really, really nice knife. This one is probably the best knife that Hogue makes. This guy here, the full-sized RSK, is a very different knife despite being the same pattern it's a much, much bigger knife. This is a full size knife and a half. If I pull back my PM2 here, it's about the same length as the PM2, but it is even thicker and feels much bigger than the PM2 in the hand. And I bring up the PM2 because I mentioned, you know, this is probably the best hard use knife design, certainly ergonomically on the market. The full-size RSK does give it a run for its money. This RSK handle with these big contours, with all this texturing, with the great jimping right behind the blade here, this again, very large neutral blade shape that gives plenty of time or plenty of distance to get down to a good, nice cutting edge with relatively stout blade stock. This is a knife that you can beat on like any knife in the, that you can beat on like any knife in the industry. Um, you can just 
hammer on this thing and it will just keep coming back for more. It will feel secure no matter how hard you push it without ever feeling grippy or grabby or anything like that. And then you still do have that fidget factor with the axis lock, which is helped by the fact this is a relatively heavy blade. So you get a nice little whoomp on the drop shut and a nice little thwack on the open. It's just a fun knife. Again, relatively affordably priced. You're talking less than 200 bucks for this knife. Made in the USA. All just very good stuff. Um, this is probably one of the ones that I could get rid of at some point. I don't end up carrying it as much just because it's a little redundant with some of the other knives I have in my collection, but it's so well done. It's so thoughtfully designed that I just like having it around. So those are the two Hogue RS case. Next in line are my two TRMs, the TRM Neutron and the TRM Atom. These are both very slicey, very nice, made in the USA knives that are around that $200 mark. And I've got flat G10 scales on these. I prefer flat G10 scales on my TRMs. I find that the texture that these, the peel ply texture on the flat scales suits the handle ergonomics and the sort of flattened edges here suit the handle ergonomics of both the Neutron and the Atom better than the contoured scale, especially the slicker materials like your carbon fiber and stuff like that. Even with the textures on top, I don't find that they offer enough grip. The Neutron is a fantastic small EDC. That's what it's known for, and it's very true. Very nice liner lock, very smooth action once it's broken in, easy to access once you get used to it. I really like this old thumb stud design, easy to catch your finger on it. And of course, you've got that neutral TRM blade shape and that thin and slicey TRM blade. It is one of those knives that is just a simple, good EDC. It's neutral on the hand. You can choke up on it. You can choke back on it. The ergonomics fit the hand very, very well. The blade shape is sharp enough for anything that you need. It's a knife that just works. And I am never unhappy when I am carrying the Neutron. That said, at least for smaller EDC tests, that said, the Atom is absolutely my favorite model from TRM. Um, and by a good margin, this long slicey blade which is very similar to the knives I'm going to talk about right after this, is just a monster when it comes to performance. It's so easy to get this knife into stuff, down onto stuff, to cut through things. The tip gets very, very nice and thin. And this larger handle is an ergonomic dream. It fills the hand very nicely. This liner lock access is excellent. The liner lock is smooth with just the right amount of resistance. Detent is a little bit stronger on the Atom. It just, it, you get all the ergonomic benefits and all the reach benefits and all basically the performance benefits of a much larger knife in something that is long, but it is thin, it is light, it is pocketable, and has that super thin and slicey blade. This knife is, to me, what the Spyderco Native Chief is trying to be. Um, I strongly prefer this one. And this, part of the reason that I like the Atom over the Neutron, is I find that the Atom can do everything that the Neutron can do while taking up not that much more space in the pocket because I don't really care that much about the open size of my blades. I really care about the size in the pocket. These are the same thickness in the pocket or nearly about the same thickness. And the Atom is not that much bigger in the pocket than the Neutron, but there is, you can do everything that you can do with the Atom or with the Neutron, you can do with the Atom but there are quite a few things that are much more comfortable to do with the Atom than with the Neutron. So the Atom is just a fantastic knife. And honestly, for non-knife people, if you ask me, hey, I'm not a knife person, I just want one knife to do basic cutting stuff with, and I want to buy something sort of enthusiast grade, I want a very good product, and somebody who's willing to not just drop, you know, 80 bucks on something but wants a good product and especially if they care about made in the USA this is probably the best one knife 
for most non-knife people, in my opinion, even in 2024, and this model is years old by this point, um, without getting into true enthusiast grade territory. To your I'm Adam, big, big fan of it. And honestly, a huge part of why I'm even keeping around the Neutron is because I like the Atom so much and I don't want to have just one TRM. I'd rather have two. Next, you've got my two Tactile Knife Co. Mavericks. This is without a doubt my favorite knife of 2023. And this is a knife that I basically bought the G10 version first on a flyer. I wasn't sure if I was going to like it or not. And then as the second that I started using it, I absolutely loved it. One thing just to note right up front is I am aware of the quality control issues that Tactile Knife Company had in the early versions of the Maverick. They had, um, they had lock stick, they had lock rock, they had poor lock up with significant blade play. There is the absolute tiniest hint of side to side blade play in these, but honestly, I would not even notice it if so many people weren't talking about blade play in their Mavericks. This guy, the G10 is the best knife of 2023, and it is an incredible knife for most people. This is the best rendition of a bar lock on the market. These studs are rounded but grippy, so they don't, they're super secure, super easy to grab, um, same thing with the thumb stud here. The way, and they took the Richard Rogers sort of triad design here and the lobe design and put it right onto your thumb stud. Super easy to catch your finger on. They grab your thumb and your fingers reliably without being abrasive. It's a really good design. The millwork on the handle is fantastic, both visually interesting and legitimately does give a lot of tactility. This blade, which is MagnaCut, is thin stock and comes down to a super thin edge. Look at how thin that edge bevel is. Just behind the edge, this thing is fantastic. And especially once you sharpen this, um, Tactile has gotten better with their factory edges. Both the factory edges on these were quite good. But then once you sharpen this, this thing is probably the best slicer in my collection. And a lot of that is also this blade shape. I really, really like these high clip points. This is my favorite gardening knife because it's so easy to pinch up on this blade, to get this knife wherever you need it to be, to get this edge behind stuff, to cut down into things. It's just a very easy knife to use. It's a joy to use. And then because most of that blade folds up in the handle, you get a full size knife that doesn't feel full size in the pocket. Again, this G10 version feels light. There's a tiny bit of flex, but nothing you wouldn't notice. People didn't complain about flex. And by the way, I actually really like this pocket clip. For those of you who don't know, because it seems like a lot of people don't know that, this isn't tactile design. This is how Richard Rogers does his pocket clips. He does standoffs, and then he has a single piece that comes down from the standoff. That is part of his signature design. There's little parts of Richard Rogers' signature designs all over this knife. I happen to think this works really well. This is just a fantastic user of a knife. It's great in the hand, it's great to the eye, it feels great, it works great. The blade is just magnificent. The action is really well done. It's just a fantastic knife. And honestly, I think a lot of people, the titanium version is very pretty. It's very well machined. The action is even smoother. The action on the, on the titanium version is noticeably smoother than on the G10 version. And I do think that's because there's the, you know, action comes down a lot to flatness and making sure that all the surfaces are perfectly, perfectly parallel, even on sort of the micro level. This probably holds its flatness a little bit better than the G10 version. And this action is very, very smooth. It's sort of like a perfectly broken in bench made and it's very pretty. It looks very nice. That said, from a utility perspective, and you can see there, it's, you know, basically it's not like, you know, they milled out some stuff, but it's not like, basically what I'm getting to is this one is heavier. This one is a lot heavier. It's a lot more expensive. And this one just actually doesn't get carried all that much because there is no practical reason for me to carry the titanium version over the G10 one. It's nice to have, and it's cool to do tasks and to feel titanium, to feel metal in your hand, especially with this great tactile texture on it. It's fun, it's enjoyable, it's cool. But 
what I'm trying to get to is if your only experience with a tactile Maverick has been dropping 300 bucks or more on a titanium version and you wanted to like it but you didn't, give a G10 version a shot because this G10 version, if I tried the titanium version first, I don't think I would have come to love the knife. I'm very happy I tried the G10 version first because all the best parts of this knife are present in the G10 version. The, the titanium version is really a collector's piece. And just to bring it out, and this one probably isn't part of the collection, but it's very, very cool. I also have this Embright version, which was a USN Blade Show exclusive. I got this off the secondary market. And I got it not really because of the Embright, but because I love these heavily blasted hardware pieces and the contrast they have with the Embright. It looks very cool. It feels very similar to the G10. Um, would I have even gotten it if it wasn't a collector and a sort of rare one that I knew that I could sell for exactly what I paid for it? Probably not. Am I going to keep it? Probably not. I haven't actually carried it since I got it because performance-wise it's the exact same as the G10 version. But it's very cool to have and it looks cool and I do love these snot green G10s like or G10 like materials, these synthetics, stuff like Embrite, like JG10, all that. Now on to the bulk of my collection, which are all knives that I have not reviewed yet, which is which are my six Chris Reeves. And the fact is, my collection has gone through ebbs and flows. I have been collecting knives at, knives at this point for, I don't know, probably five, six years. And every there have been a couple times I have sold all my Chris Reeves. And every single time I have sold all my Chris Reeves, about six to nine months later, I have sold everything that I bought to replace them and bought them back. I've got two Encosis here, both with natural micarta inlays, both drop point. Um, you've got a small here. Let me clear these out and go piece by piece. You've got a small here and a large here. So, the Encosi. Um, the large Encosi here is the one knife that I would actually put peer to peer with the PM2 for the title of best hard use knife. This is the one other knife that as much as the PM2, the harder you grip it, the better it feels. It is in the ergonomic lines for my hands are absolutely unmatched on the Encosi. The way that these finger grooves mold into my fingers and contain my fingers securely, it feels literally like when you were a kid and you had a hunk of play-doh and you grip the play-doh and it sort of went in between the gaps in your fingers that's what this knife feels like to me it is so amazingly secure in the hand without being grippy or grabby or pokey it's just perfect for my hands that is mo much more the case with these inlays i got these inlays on the Encosi for ergonomic purposes, not for aesthetic purposes. I like the way they look, but I do find that the Encosi can feel a little, the grip isn't quite as good when you don't have these inlays to anchor your fingers onto. So I, so I prefer the inlays on these. They are a significant upcharge these days, but I think the Encosi in particular is a better knife with the inlays. But the reason I love the Encosi is this blade. The handle is fantastic. The handle is one of the best in the industry but Chris Reeves blades are absolutely unmatched. Beautiful stone wash, but it really is this hollow grind that does it. You've got relatively thick blade stock, about as thick as the PM2 here, but the hollow grind that Chris Reeves puts on there, and by the way, my strong recommendation, I credit Erica from, um, now I guess it's Erica's EDC for convincing me to do this, or just from, from her videos that convinced me to do it, not that I've had personal interaction with her, this is not a Chris Reeve edge. This is my own edge on here. These are super thin behind the edge. Super, super thin behind the edge. With the default Chris Reeve convex grind or convex edge, you don't really feel that sharpness. They're ground like workhorse knives at the edge. You put a conventional 17 degree edge on, on here, this becomes one of the best slicers in your entire collection. This thing will cut through 
anything. It will glide through anything while still having blade stock that is as tough as ro and robust as just about anything in my collection. The action, I don't need to talk about Chris Reeve action. Chris Reeve action is beautiful. The liner lock is perfectly executed. The bead blast finish takes on wear better than anything else. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal hard use knife. The small Nkosi has the benefit of being very small. And it is a very small knife. The ergonomics absolutely takes some getting used to. But once you do get used to them, you get a very stout little knife. This feels like the native in that it is a small, very small little knife that can punch way above its weight. And even more than the native, this is a knife that is a tiny knife that I can push very hard. And again, you get a very sharp edge on it once you put your own edge on it. I prefer a conventional edge significantly over the Chris Reeve edges on these. It really shows off the best that Chris Reeve grind. Then you've got my two Sabenzas. I have not reviewed the small Sabenza yet, but the small Sabenza is my favorite knife. And price is not an issue. If you want one knife, the best knife in the industry in 2024, in my opinion, is still the small Sabenza for most people. This is not actually a stick. You look closer and you see it's bowed subtly the whole way. And that does so much to make the ergonomics work. It actually does hold your hand in place in the way that most more basic neutral handles don't. It guides your hand exactly where it should be. The These bevels up here make a pinch grip masterful. Um, the jimping on the back is just enough to give you some grip. This texture helps keep your hand right where it needs to be, gives you something that you don't slip on. Of course, the texture just wears in so beautifully. The action is even better on the Sabenza than the Nkosi because of that bushing pivot. And then with the thinner blade sock here, this thing just slices wonderfully. The Chris Reeve hollow grind gets so thin behind the edge. This cuts so incredibly well. It's just a fantastic blade. Every time I use this for EDC, I am happy to have it. And there is no knife. And then you, you take the other design magnificence here is how small it gets in the pocket, how relatively light it is, and how, especially for how robust it is, how satisfying it is to use. There's just not a better knife on the market, in my opinion, than the small Sabenza for most people. And if the small Sabenza isn't enough for you, the large Sabenza is everything that is great about the small Sabenza, but bigger. I don't actually use the large Sabenza nearly as much because I just don't need a knife this big all that often, and it is a big knife. But the same ergonomic lines, the same incredible cutting performance. In fact, this one slices even better than the small because even though the blade stock is a little thinner, it's got more space to drop. Really, the reason that I love Chris Reeve so much are these insane hollow grinds. They just get so very slicey. You combine that with the perfect actions. You combine that with the exceptional fit and finish. Everything about their, uh, they're just, they're the best knives out there. Um, and honestly, if you told me that I could only have six knives and I had to sell everything else, it would be my six Chris Reeves. If you told me I could only have four, it would be the Sabenzas and Nkosis. And if you told me I could only have two, it would be the Sabenzas. It's not even a question. They're just, they're the best. And then the last two I've got here is I do have two Umnumzons because I like to have pairs. These do not get carried or used all that often, but they are just cool. They are huge. They are tanky. They are super robust, but like all the other Chris Reeves, and they're different only in the blade shape, it's this blade that is the star of the show. These are actually the sliciest knives that Chris Reeve makes because that hollow grind has so much space to drop. It's an absolute laser beam behind the edge. If I am breaking down cardboard for an entire day or something like that, these are the knives that I pick. One of these two, the Tonto, is actually up toward the front, even a little bit sharper in my experience than the drop point. But they look cool, they feel cool, they're, and then they perform extraordinarily well. This is what hinderers are trying to be, if you ask me. These are hinderers that actually perform well. Yes, they don't have the really strong, really controlling ergonomic lines of a hinderer. But honestly, I would still choose my Nkosi over a hinderer if you give me that choice. And then, 
the last two, two I have not shown on the channel at all. These are the two customs that I have held on to. So I used to, years ago, have a relatively large collection of custom knives. Very high-end knives. I would say my collection at one point was probably worth $15,000. Actually, I know it was $15,000 because I had a single Reddit sale that was $14,000 worth of knives. These are the last two customs that have stuck around. Partially because they're not worth that much, but partially because they are so darn cool. And they are everything that is cool about custom knife making. These are Fareed Mare K2s. This one is in S90V. This one is in D3, which is a more high hardness version of D2. These knives are dumb. There is no practical use for them, but they are so much fun. These are truly handmade, one-off by Fareed Mare. And you can see, like, the tang sticks out, this sticks out here. Things aren't totally flush. Everything is kind of weird and wonky. The backspacer is a piece of steel that was heat pressed to fit between them. The lock bar relief is this wiggly waggly thing. L, the screws are proud. It's just weird. And weird in the way that like, uh, this is obviously done by hand because nothing quite fits together perfectly. I mean, it's all consistent. It's, it's actually masterfully done, but there is nothing about this that feels CNC machined. But the real reason that these things are cool, besides all the little cool features, are the grinds on these things, which are insane. So first off, look at this blade saw. This is 20, 20, 0.2 inches thick. In fact, I think it might even be a little bit more than 0.2 inches thick, both of them. And they're chisel ground. They're chisel ground. And they're even saber chisel ground. But these things cut better than almost anything else in my collection, and it's completely absurd. Fareed puts these wild convex grinds. There are almost zero grinds on there. Look at the look at the uh, grind lines on that. These things are like having a zipper for cardboard. It's like taking the cardboard box you want to cut and putting a zipper on them. You grab these things, and by the way, ergonomics, out of control good. Harsh line, so it's going to hold your hand, and you feel those corners, but boy, oh boy, does this thing stick in your hand. But you start cutting through cardboard with this, and even with that thick stock, because the way this grind naturally parts the cardboard, especially with that chisel grind where you're only pushing one edge through, it literally just zips through cardboard. It... If I am cutting through abrasive materials like that, same sort of experience with carpet, as long as the carpet has a little give and it's not so thick, these things literally feel slicier than some of my super slicey spider coats, and it's because of that insane grind. I keep these because they are an example of why you buy custom knives. This is a bunch of stuff that can really only be done by a custom knife maker. This sort of grind, you're only going to see it from a custom knife maker. They're stupid, they're wild, they're completely impractical, but they are so much fun even to look at and hold the action. Sucks at first, but once it breaks in, it is wonderfully smooth, super mechanical, super clicky. This thing actually drops shut, despite being on Teflon washers. They're just awesome, awesome, awesome knives and it would be hard for me to ever part with them and certainly not worth the couple hundred bucks that they fetch on the secondary market but really that blade performance is just absurd i'll have a full review of these sometime later and that let me bring back the encosis here that is the state of my collection as of february 2024 and so thanks for anybody who watched this thanks for everybody who subscribed so so far I hope the time that you've spent with this channel so far has been a good use of your time, and I hope that it continues to be. Um, look for more coming, and we will see where the collection ends up when we hit 1,000. Thanks so much. Talk to you again soon.